to our time because for the whole period of modern economic growth since 1800 till now, uh, it's been based on exploiting whatever uh, is uh, available, especially fossil fuels. And we developed a world economy essentially based on fossil fuels. Uh, and incidentally, this means that the world's oil companies are not only among the largest companies in the world, but they're among the most powerful political actors in the world as well. They're the most powerful lobbies. Uh, they uh, uh, affect uh, governments uh, very uh, powerfully. And the problem is that simply going along with more fracking or uh, more uh, uh, development of uh, seabed methane or as Japanese scientists uh, uh, did a few, uh, few weeks ago, unveiled uh, the early tests of uh, trying to tap the methane hydrates. Uh, th this may be uh, uh, very uh, innovative technology, but if uh, developed on a large scale, it could be extraordinarily destructive of the world's well-being. Uh, and so we need to develop the technologies that lead away from CO2, not the technologies that lead towards more CO2. And there definitely is no clarity on this in international policy right now because governments tend to be very short-term everywhere. Uh, they want the lowest market price of energy. Uh, and uh, if uh, hydrofracking or uh, the uh, oil sands uh, uh, are uh, the, the lowest short-term cost. Uh, governments are prepared to ignore the climate consequences from that. And of course, it's not just climate uh, consequences. All of the CO2 that we are putting into the air is uh, destroying the ocean food webs. Uh, the oceans have already acidified by 30% relative to the pre-industrial baseline. This is uh, a really extraordinarily frightening prospect for the world because a tremendous amount of the uh, whole marine ecosystems depend uh, on, uh, on, on uh, a, a biology of uh, uh, both micro and macro organisms that uh, need, uh, that won't survive in, in more acidified oceans, to put it simply. Uh, and our governments need to come up with a plan. Uh, and all we're doing is very ad hoc measures right now. Uh, and the United States is probably the most ad hoc of them all. President Obama's energy policy is called uh, all of the above. Uh, well, all of the above, I, I think, is a lobbyist dream uh, because it says we'll take anything. Uh, but it is uh, an environmental nightmare. Uh, and uh, we need, actually, a low carbon energy policy, not an all of the above policy. Uh, and uh, this is a worldwide challenge. Uh, I think the post-2015 global development agenda now being set at the UN will put the low CO2 agenda central uh, to the world's uh, um, needs. But then every government's going to have to come up with a strategy uh, that is a lot more specific, detailed, focused, realistic, consequent, and long-term than it is right now. And it's only within that context it's possible to answer a question like yours. Does a particular energy source fit? It depends on the overall package. If it just adds to CO2, the answer is no. Okay, next question. from Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in Germany. I have two questions. The first is, did you discuss the Japan government bond deals at the conference? Because uh, it seems not to work. So Mr. Kuroda, some economists say, already failed with his policy in this regard. Up to now, what the sense? The government bond deals, the long-term government bond Because they're rising. Yes, because they're arriving and they're even higher than the Shia Kama times. So some, monetary, uh, some uh, economists say monetary easing might even have a, yes, reached its limit. So did you discuss it? And could you give us, because I never found up to now, an uh, explanation why it didn't work up to now, why it won't work? Uh, second question is, you said uh, China is most important for economic growth, especially in Japan. Up to now, the, let's say, 
mentor seat of the Japanese Prime Minister seemed to be a bit more critical to China. So while discussing at the cabinet office, did you get any hints that they might become more pragmatic in this way, or is ideology stronger than pragmatism? You know, in, in economic uh, logic, uh, if you expand the rate of increase of the money supply, you could get the nominal interest rate rising a bit, but less than the rise of prices and inflation. And so the real interest rate can come down even as the nominal interest rate goes up a bit. So I wouldn't say that anything we've observed in the market right now shows a failure of the monetary policy. I would look rather to the two key prices that I mentioned. One is the equity prices, which have gone up considerably, even net of the recent uh, declines. And second is the currency depreciation. Because both of those are pointing the way they are, my own view is that uh, uh, this monetary policy is working. Uh, now, if it raises longer term inflation expectations, that could boost the long term nominal interest rate even while reducing the long term real interest rate. I think it's a little hard to say that long term expectations are very clear right now uh, because this is early days of this policy change. But I, I would absolutely not consider what we've observed uh, in any way counter to the basic path that one would expect. Uh, and my view is this policy is on course. Uh, again, the short-term effects work through the, uh, probably mainly through the exchange rate, uh, and then second through the uh, stock market values and the net wealth effect. Uh, and uh, only over the longer term in the real interest rate, not nominal interest rate effect. Uh, there are many detailed challenges uh, in all of this uh, without question, but I, I think that the basic direction is uh, uh, being, the basic uh, points of monetary theory are being confirmed in, in the practice that we're, that we're observing. When it comes to uh, um, Japan and China, I certainly didn't uh, have a, 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 a detailed discussion uh, um, it, on, on this point, but I did make the point uh, to the government, senior government officials, uh, my own view that uh, a good, uh, healthy uh, relationship uh, between China and Japan is very important for the uh, economy uh, and uh, very constructive uh, for uh, Many, many things, uh, uh, including uh, China's sustainable development, for exactly the reason I was stressing that Japan has a lot to offer China in know-how, in technology, uh, in an ability to clean up cities which have become so polluted that they are uh, in uh, present uh, danger to, uh, to Chinese citizens because of uh, how dirty the air is in, in many, uh, many of the big cities. And Japan went through a phase like that, uh, and it did uh, remarkable job of cleaning up, and it knows a lot about that. It has both the technology and the systems know-how, and I hope there's therefore a good, strong, cooperative relationship between the two countries. Okay. Theo. <coughs> from Italy, Sky TG24. Now, I'm taking advantage of the fact that you are one of the hundred more influential uh, people to try to understand also what's going on uh, in our small part of the world. Uh, not only about Italy specifically, but economics, let's call it. Um, don't you think that uh, among the hours that may hit very hard, not only Europe, but as a consequence, the whole world is the possible social unrest coming out from uh, unemployment and other social issues. So how do you judge, how do you foresee the impact of unemployment, rising unemployment in European countries, including, unfortunately, our country? And the second question is uh, about the 
a lot has been said about uh, this currency. Until a few months ago, it was about to die. The neurologists were already ready on newspapers, you know, <laughs> funerals uh, prepared. Now it seems that we are back on uh, full, still full uh, ahead. What is your opinion, hope, and fears about Europe? The, the Eurozone crisis uh, is uh, clearly a crisis of a monetary union that lacks the support of financial institutions. Uh, so the Eurozone uh, is still a, a work in progress is the basic, uh, basic problem. In my view, the most important problem that the southern tier of the Eurozone, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece face is the crisis of the banking sector uh, because uh, the banks uh, lost a tremendous amount of uh, their uh, net worth uh, and the depositors uh, and the interbank lines of credit uh, dried up and this has meant a, a very uh, terrible credit squeeze uh, in uh, southern Europe. Uh, this, even more than fiscal policy, is the biggest problem. Uh, a small or medium-sized enterprise in Italy or Greece can hardly get credit. Uh, and if you can't get credit in small enterprise, the economy can't function. And so it's kind of a dying away of the economy from below. Uh, too much talk about, fi about fiscal policy, by the way, because the problems are not mainly about budgets. The problems are mainly about uh, the European banking sector. And the European response so far has been to finally acknowledge that there is a need for a banking union, but to say, well, that will take many months, maybe many years, and uh, countries don't have that time uh, to uh, just wait uh, for uh, the political uh, timetable of uh, some of the major powers. And this, I think, is what is quite unfortunate. Uh, I uh, observed this quite closely uh, in the case of Greece, where there's no short-term credit available and hasn't been for many years, and the Greek economy has collapsed as a result of this. But uh, the European institutions were unable or unwilling to respond to this banking crisis in a timely way. And this is the real uh, mistake, actually, of European policy up until now, the failure to act more quickly on recapitalizing the banks or establishing special credit lines for small and medium enterprises so that even if the major banks are in crisis, there still is a way for small industry to survive uh, rather than to die. Uh, and I still hope the European Central Bank, uh, the German government, which is obviously uh, in the driver's seat of so much, would uh, take more urgent measures around financial policy, not the budget so much, but finance so that this credit drought uh, or credit famine of Southern Europe uh, can be brought to an end and business can start again in, in Italy and in, uh, in Greece and, uh, and in the neighboring countries. What about social unrest, the first question? About social, social unrest? Well, social unrest is real uh, and uh, it is uh, absolutely evident uh, that uh, societies uh, are uh, really fraught into the limit and uh, also there have been such glaring political deficiencies in countries uh, that are that have this uh, very high unemployment uh, political uh, look at the, the Italian crisis uh, with the former prime minister under how many indictments uh, and uh, how many scandals uh, or the scandals uh, in uh, in Spain or uh, the a tax fraud uh, that is uh, so widespread uh, with the senior politicians uh, being paid out of Swiss bank accounts. So this is the combination of a huge social crisis and a political crisis simultaneously. Uh, and obviously there's very deep disenchantment and uh, it's, uh, it is, uh, it's very dangerous. Uh, and that's why there should be faster action, and especially faster action on, uh, on uh, correcting these financial 
uh, blunders uh, of uh, the Eurozone so that uh, business can get operating again and jobs been, can be created. And, by the way, these businesses will start paying taxes once again or once they can live, breathe, and operate. We're seeing a wide range of topics here. Mr. Harris. number when Shinbin, the, the club's magazine. And you'll see in, in the lobby the poster for our cover story that this month, which is about the diminishing chances of Tokyo's Olympic bid to host the Summer Olympics. And one of the key questions in this was which way the African votes will go. That, um, uh, we, <laughs> so we haven't factored in TCAD. Uh, so everybody, people were speculating that the Chinese will, uh, you know, all, all their pull in Africa now will take the votes away from uh, from uh, Tokyo. So do you have any sense of what TCAD did, having all these African heads of state, whether it increased? Is our stock up? You know, I, I'm not part, of the, uh, not part of the bidding process, but I, but I can tell you that uh, whatever process there is, TCAD uh, must have helped, uh, because it really was a superb meeting. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, so uh, um, uh, Prime Minister Abe, as far as I remember, only mentioned the Olympics once uh, in, in one of his speeches, uh, maybe in the opening address. Uh, but uh, I, I can say surely that uh, the African delegations uh, felt uh, very good that there was a serious uh, really a, a serious and substantial meeting here. And uh, when I was looking through the uh, Yokohama Plan of Action yesterday and today, it's quite a substantial document, very uh, specific, uh, quite uh, methodical in a Japanese way, I would say. Lots of tables, lots of matrices, uh, lots of uh, very clear uh, designation of who's going to do what and when. Uh, and that's all to the good. Uh, so I think uh, probably Japan scored some points this uh, some uh, so this past uh, weekend, but uh, it wasn't a preeminent topic of the conference. Okay, that was a one out of the blue. There we go. Here we go. A new speaker. <laughs> And uh, considering your uh, enormous contribution to Millennium Development Goal, and uh, finally, we do see Africa coming out in the limelight. So I want to ask you, are you still um, sticking to your 2025 uh, uh, timeline, or you have revised it? Yeah, good, good, good question. Thanks a lot. You know, in uh, 2005, I wrote a book called The End of Poverty, where I said uh, the world could and extreme poverty by the year 2025. Uh, that view was taken as uh, pretty outlandish by a lot of people. But I'm very happy that the World Bank formally voted last month, uh, actually in April, uh, that uh, the goal of ending extreme poverty by the year 2030 would be the formal goal of the World Bank. Uh, and now in the post uh, 2015 negotiating agenda, there's a new global consensus that the end of extreme poverty will be the number one goal of the post-2015 period. So you can imagine it's very gratifying for me uh, to see that because uh, this idea, which was viewed as uh, rather uh, way out there uh, and uh, outlandish and uh, dream a little bit dreamy, uh, is now being voted by the hard-headed bankers uh, and uh, taken on by, by the world's governments. Uh, 2020, 20, 2025 or 2030, uh, I'd, uh, I'd take either. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think that if we can end extreme poverty in this generation, it will be one of the great accomplishments uh, uh, of humanity and uh, one of the uh, most important uh, uh, steps for global peace that uh, could be achieved. Uh, there are huge risks, lost time, you know, part of the slippage of the, of the time horizon was uh, the financial crisis, uh, these wasteful wars uh, in, in uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan and so forth that to my mind were a huge distraction from development. Uh, and uh, 
uh, I'm hoping that uh, the world can get focused uh, again on the most important things, which is sustainable development, because peace will follow that. Uh, peace can by wars, uh, peace can be made by sustainable development, uh, and uh, but this timeline now is being viewed as realistic. So I'm very excited uh, about that. Okay, time for a couple more questions. Yes, Brazil, Brazil newspaper global. Uh, professor, uh, emerging economies like China and Brazil are not doing so good anymore. It's not a tragedy yet, but the news are not so good. I'd like to hear from you. Are you still optimistic about the traditional emerging markets from the BRICS, for example? Yes. I still believe the emerging economies will outpace the high-income world by a significant margin on a sustained basis. Uh, and uh, in recent years, the emerging and developing countries have been growing at between 5 and 6 percent per year, and the high-income countries between 1 and 2 percent per year. So the gap has been about 4 percentage points. That seems to me to be still uh, a, a, an achievable uh, margin and signifying continued convergence of uh, the middle income countries to uh, the uh, high income country standards. Of course, the challenges are, are very great. Uh, these are not simple, uh, simple growth rates to achieve and to sustain. They require strong government policies. They face this more and more complicated agenda of sustainable development, which doesn't simplify anything because not only do you have to grow, but you have to grow cleanly now. Uh, you have to grow in a, in a uh, low carbon manner. Uh, you have to grow in a way that preserves rather than destroys biodiversity. And so I'd say the technical level of challenges and the political organization is harder than, than it has been in the past. It used to be just follow what the country ahead did uh, and do the same thing, sell as many cars, build cities the usual way, and so on. But that doesn't work anymore, so we're in, in new territory. And I'm really hoping that the emerging economies, Brazil and China and India, regard uh, this new agenda as uh, an opportunity rather than just a massive hindrance. Brazil, of course, has been a pioneer in low carbon energy. It's got one of the lowest carbon uh, economies, uh, lowest carbon intensities in the world because of hydropower and biofuels and, and so on. Very innovative. Uh, I'll be in Rio uh, in, in just a couple of weeks. Uh, to uh, help inaugurate a new center uh, following the Rio Plus 20 conference uh, on uh, sustainable development. And I saw the president last week uh, in Addis Ababa uh, and uh, spoke with her briefly about this. Um, so I think that there are absolutely opportunities for this kind of continued development uh, in a project that I'm leading, by the way, for uh, the United Nations Secretary General Rio is uh, uh, our uh, is a uh, priority city for sustainable development, and part of the work uh, in uh, later in June will be planning uh, major initiatives in sustainability for Rio, because uh, there are obviously great opportunities, and Rio is going to be very much uh, in the spotlight in the next few years, uh, and we hope in a, in a wonderful way. So uh, I am optimistic. Is, is That's the long answer. The short answer is yes. <laughs> okay, we have time for one quick question. Maybe one of the associates can get a question in. Oh, no, a non-associate, but that's all right. Former president of the club, so. <laughs> We have to. Thanks for of Science Magazine. Great. Uh, you've talked about a lot, uh, you talk a lot about moving towards a low carbon economy. Uh, as an American running for an American publication, there's still a lot of denial in the U.S. What are, the, are you optimistic about the political process and the, uh, the recognition among the public of the need? move towards a low-carbon economy in the U.S.? 
you know, in the uh, opinion surveys, uh, there is uh, overwhelming uh, acceptance of the proposition that the climate's changing among Americans. And then there is a, a pretty, uh, pretty strong uh, segment of the population that feels that it's human-induced, but that's a lower number, of course. There's a quite strong segment uh, of the American public, a solid majority, that is in favor of renewable energy. But uh, then there are the oil companies. Uh, and my view is that a lot of what we observe in the United States is a mix of a solid but uh, minority view that it is a denial of view, maybe a hard 25 or 30 percent for religious or other ideological reasons, uh, combined with an extremely powerful, maybe the most powerful lobby uh, in the U.S., which is uh, coal, oil, and gas. Uh, and uh, when you think about the amount of money at stake, when you think about what the Koch brothers do, uh, when you think about how Rupert Murdoch uh, feeds the, uh, is, opens uh, his pages in Fox News for the oil lobby on a relentless basis, uh, it, it uh, will require true political leadership to tap into what I think is a majority of Americans ready for a new approach. But we haven't had that kind of strong leadership yet. Uh, and uh, the politicians are afraid of it. Uh, they don't want to touch it. We go long periods without even hearing the word climate, uh, as you know. Uh, President Obama absolutely knows how uh, important this issue is, but won't take it on in a major way. Uh, and uh, so I don't, I, my, my bottom line is uh, I actually don't think that it's the public that is the obstacle. Uh, I think that it is the extremely powerful interests uh, that are the obstacle. And I do feel that there's been one huge missing uh, part from the advocacy side, and that is clear, substantial, science-based plans of action. And I'll give an example. In my view, the single best study on decarbonizing the energy system in the United States was published in Science for the state of California. Uh, the article uh, um, by Jim Williams uh, um, and, uh, and colleagues. It's the best article I know uh, that's been published about how to decarbonize the U.S. energy system. But it only applies for one state. Beautiful job. When I talked to the authors of that and said, why don't you do that for the U.S., they said that they got such political pushback at the national level uh, that even though there are teams around the U.S. absolutely able to take the California study and generalize it, it was very hard to mobilize the support. I'm trying to mobilize the support with them, actually, and with uh, Margaret Torn and Jim Williams and others who are your authors uh, for a national scale study. Because I think that if we could help the American people, and the same is true in Japan or China or elsewhere, to not only know that we have a serious problem, but actually that there's a very uh, specific technology-based way out of the problem, then the ability to build a coalition in favor of a low-carbon energy transition will be there. So keep publishing great articles uh, on this. Uh, you did publish what I regard as the, the best single article on uh, low-carbon transition. But we don't have it in a way that the public understands yet, and therefore it's too easy for the oil lobbies to fight it. And uh, this is a battle with the lobbyists. Okay, well, I'm afraid we have to leave it there, Professor Tanzex. Thank you very much for your time today. As befits a world traveler, we've covered the globe, I think, in terms of topics. And I should say that if your travels do bring you back to Japan, we have an honorary membership at the club for oh, next year. Oh, so we would we'll we'll be more than thrilled to have you come back. I'll be back. Speak to us again. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. So I'm afraid he won't be able to chat with anybody, including Pierre, but never mind. Thank you.